we will continue our discussion on uh, uh, concurrency control algorithms in this class. Last uh, few lectures just to recap what we have been doing, we have looked at a class of algorithms, tried classifying them into two broad classes pessimistic algorithms and optimistic algorithms. In the last class in particular, we have seen in depth where exactly uh, this difference between optimistic and pessimistic kind of algorithms come. Class before we have actually seen how 2 p l works in the context of pessimistic algorithms and we also mentioned that in this class we are going to look at one optimistic uh, concurrency control algorithm. Before we actually look at, we are also going to look at what we understand as a timestamp based algorithms as opposed to locking, we will look at timestamp based concurrency control algorithms. Now, not all timestamp based algorithms are optimistic algorithms that you should first understand. Timestamping algorithms essentially use the notion of time for serialization, that is what um, they do. Timestamp uh, based algorithms need not necessarily be optimistic algorithms, but one can formulate optimistic algorithms and remember what we are actually meaning by optimistic algorithms. We were saying that the validity of the operations done by the transaction is checked at the end of the execution of the transaction. That is what we actually mean by the optimistic algorithms. Now, it is not necessary that all timestamp based algorithms check for the consistency of the results, consistency of the operations done by the transaction at the end of the execution. They may do something in between, they do not need to necessarily do it only at the end of the execution of the transaction, it is possible to do it. So, what we will do in this class is we will try to understand uh, in a simple way which we call as a basic timestamp algorithm. We will try to understand how timestamp based algorithms work in the context of concurrency control. What we are also going to do is look at how you know, when you apply the timestamp based algorithms, how the recovery properties which commit properties and recovery properties are integrated into the timestamp based concurrency control algorithms. If you remember when the earlier lecture on two phase locking, we did discuss how locking algorithms are integrated with the commit protocols. So, we are going to do the same exercise of looking at timestamp based concurrency control algorithms and also look at how timestamp based algorithms um, will integrate with commit based uh, algorithms. So, that is what we are going to do in this lecture. Now, we will first proceed to look at basic timestamp based algorithms. So, what we will do is we will explain uh, the timestamp based algorithms by taking a simple case of a basic algorithm which is called the basic timestamp based algorithm. Concurrency control algorithm. The algorithm has several basic things that that's that's are done like in any other concurrency control algorithm. The first thing that is done is typically in this particular case every transaction is given a timestamp. 
see this is if you typically look at you know very good example in real life of getting a time stamp and then executing what you want to do the darshan of lord venkateshwara you know the tirupati tirumala tirupati devasthanam has this uh, thing called they give the time band you know when you actually want to have the darshan of the lord they say that you have to obtain a time band you know now what exactly the time band means they give you a time sticker and says that if you actually go there in you know before that time or just about that time you will be able to see the uh, lord so they basically in, in other words uh, the darshan of uh, the lord is to be serialized because only you know you can see one after the other if you see the queue one has to move to see the lord so there is basically a serializability problem there now one of the ways we solve this in real life is by saying that you need this band you know this band is generated what does that band means that you are essentially getting a time stamp time band and says that you all the people who have got this time band have to proceed in the order of the time that they have got that means they will be viewing the lord in terms of their time bands okay in a similar way if you look at how the transactions are going to execute each transaction when it just entered the system it gets this similar time band that's what is called a time stamp you know how exactly this time stamp is given to the transaction we are going to look at later when you look at details of this step but the idea of giving a time stamp to the transaction is that essentially time stamp serializes the order in which the transactions are executed all transactions are executed as per uh, in the increasing order of the time if a transaction has got a time stamp its uh, its order in terms of execution is fixed because all those transactions which got a time stamp before this transaction will commit before this transaction all those which got a which got a time stamp higher than this can proceed and are going to commit after this transaction is committed so in that sense the serial order time the notion of time here serializes the uh, transaction execution this is a very important concept this notion of time and using that notion of time for serialization is a very important concept as we go further down we going to look at distributed transactions where a single transaction is split into sub transactions and executed on multiple sites this is like now not using one single time stamp for example each person could be carrying his own uh, wrist watch so you get into additional problems of how do i actually take these different times and now put them all in one time zone for example now london will be in one time zone chennai will be in one time zone so if you are actually generating transactions in different time zones you get into problems of thing now if, you, if all of us are using a single clock automatically everything will be serializable but if they are using multiple time zones then you get the additional problem of making sure that the events across these multiple time zones are again serialized we are going to look at that notion when we go and then look at distributed transactions and see how this notion of time becomes critical when you want to address the concurrency control problems in the case of distributed databases so to understand at a very you know simple level what uh, really is happening is when the transactions are coming in into the system you are giving them a time stamp and you are expecting that the transactions execute with respect to their time and that essentially produces a serializability to look at the basic steps in little more detail as i was uh, trying to do here every transaction to start with will be given a time stamp this time stamp is the one which will be used subsequently for checking whether the transaction is executing in a consistent fashion or not 
Now, all read and write operations of the transaction are tagged with this timestamp read operations and write operations of the transaction are tagged with this timestamp write operations of the transactions are tagged with this TS. We will call this timestamp as TS. So, all the read and write operations are actually tagged with this timestamp. Okay. That is the second thing. So, when a transaction issues a read or a write operation, let us say a transaction TI has got a timestamp of 1020 as it is, let us just understand or at this point of time it is 1130. So, we will say the transaction has got a timestamp of 1130. Now, subsequently whatever read or write operations that are being performed by this transaction will all get the same number because that is only one, one timestamp we are going to use. For example, at a later point of time when it is 1135 or 1140 we are doing something, but they all belong to the same transaction they are not given a different timestamp. this is very important all the reads and write operations of the transaction are tagged with the same timestamp, which is given to the st start of the execution of the transaction. Okay. Now, what do we do after this point of time? We also have to actually know okay, for every data item in the database, okay, for every data item x, we need actually what is the read timestamp of the what is the read timestamp of x and uh, the read timestamp of x shows the timestamp of the okay the timestamp of the transaction okay that has read the value of uh, read the value of x. What does this mean? This means let us say there is a data item x and it, there, there is a transaction which read this data item and its timestamp is let us say 1150 that is the highest transaction. There could be transactions with timestamp lower than this which also read this data item, but we are going to consider the highest timestamp of the transactions that has read the value of x will be the RTS of this x. Similarly, the right timestamp of x is the timestamp the highest timestamp if you want to actually qualify it the highest timestamp or TS of the transaction that wrote the value of x transaction that wrote the value of x. Okay. So, for every data item you are going to have two timestamps corresponding to the transaction highest timestamp value of the transaction that has read the value and also the highest timestamp of the transaction which wrote the value. Why do I need this two? Because this is essentially tells with respect to this data item what are the earlier transactions that I have actually done on the uh, whether the read or write operation are performed by these transactions on this particular data item. Now, we will use these timestamps to see the validity criterion when a new transaction comes and tries to do some manipulation on this data item, we are going to look at it and say which are all those values which can be allowed by the transaction manager to proceed and which needs to be aborted. Now, 
this is the preliminary thing in terms of how exactly the uh, algorithm maintains the data. Now in terms of actual execution what it does is whenever a transaction okay, now uh, consider the case when a transaction uh, issues okay, a transaction issues a read operation okay, issues a read operation. Now this read will be tagged with the timestamp of the transaction. So basically essentially this is the TS of the read operation okay, timestamp of the read operation. Now this TS has to be compared with the data item timestamps. Now this let us say the read timestamp of X and write timestamp of read operation we will say on X. Okay. A transaction with timestamp TS issues a read operation on X. Now the RTS and WTS values of this X are the following. Now what is the condition now this read operation can be allowed to proceed. Okay. Now the read operation can be allowed to go further as long as the condition that the timestamp of X the, the current transaction is greater than the right timestamp of X. Please remember reads can be shared after I write a value any number of people can read that value. But if you assume that only you know if uh, I am actually reading a value after somebody is actually written a value on it which means that my timestamp value is lesser than what actually has been produced then I need to be little careful and avoid such operations. Understand the condition where TS is less than WTS of X okay. if okay, TS timestamp of the transaction is less than timestamp of this current transaction is less than the right timestamp of X what does this actually imply that means a later transaction has actually written the value a later transaction than me has written the value a later transaction has written the value of X. Now if in terms of time stamp order if you want to execute the transaction strictly in the time stamp order this should not have happened because now if I am actually reading a value produced by somebody who is coming later uh, than me. Okay. This is like saying that you know if you, if you look at uh, senior junior relationship you know now if, if you essentially say that I am actually passing the batch which is supposed to have passed in 2004 says, says that it is actually passing after uh, the 2003 batch there is a violation because 2003 batch has already gone which means that the value written by X is by transaction later than me or it is older than me. Now I cannot come back and say I am going to read its value. Okay. So unless I had actually finished the later transaction would not have been able to come and do what it is trying to do. So in that sense now if this is the case transaction T is to be uh, the issuing transaction has to be aborted uh, the transaction which is actually issuing if this is the case the transaction issuing the, the transaction uh, which issues which issued okay, which issued the read operation needs to be aborted okay. and it is restarted okay, and restarted with a higher time stamp obviously because when you restart you are going to get a higher value timestamp restarted with uh, 
a larger time stamp. Okay. Now understand what I am saying by just going one back. Okay. A transaction issues a read operation T s on x. Now the transactions timestamp is T s here as shown here and uh, the current values in the database as far as R T s and W T s are concerned are shown here. R T s shows the transaction the largest timestamp of a transaction that has read the value of x. W T s shows the timestamp largest timestamp of a transaction which has written a value on x. Now if my timestamp is less than W T x I do not need to compare this RTS, RTX value because even if it is higher since reads can be shareable they need not be exclusive I am still not violating any consistency uh, things only write I have to read something earlier written by transaction which is earlier than me than rather than a transaction later than me. Okay. This essentially shows that a later transaction has written the value of x the transaction which issued the read operation needs to be aborted in such a case and restarted with a larger time stamp. And when you restart it the chance of this transaction succeeding is higher because now it will take this and proceed further and the chance of the transaction succeeding later is very high. This is what will be done as far as the read operation is concerned. Now if you look at the write operation a transaction let us say with a write operation okay transaction with a time stamp with a time stamp okay t s issues a issues a write operation okay Now if it issues a write operation you have to check now let us say there are again similar case of RTX is the current value WTS is the current value of the data item X write operation will say on X okay. in which case the RTX and the WTX are the current values. Now you need to check if either of these conditions are true the T s is less than the R T x or T s of that is the read time stamp or the T s is less than the write time stamp of x then what does this imply? This implies that I am writing a value into x which was read by a later transaction or written by a later transaction. In both these cases what I am saying is now I am trying to manipulate the value of a data item but somebody has actually who comes later than me has actually read this value or written this value. In either of these cases this results in, in an inconsistent situation because somebody who is coming later than me has actually read. So I am actually modifying something you would have read a stale value. Similarly, if it is already modified that value will be last if I come now and then start modifying it. So in that sense in both these conditions the write has to be rejected okay. the write operation has to be rejected the write on x to be rejected. Now what does this reject means same as the earlier case that the issuing transaction has to be. Okay the issuing transaction needs to be aborted and restarted with a higher time stamp. The issuing transaction needs to be aborted and restarted with a higher time stamp. Now this essentially explains the basic steps of the time stamping algorithm. Okay. Now what uh, 
we are trying to do in this particular case is we are trying to say that the algorithm uh, tries to provide okay, a basis for uh, you know checking. We give the uh, uh, transaction a timestamp. Now we didn't still discuss how the transaction will be given a timestamp. You no, know. there are several ways in which this can be done. One way is actually uh, you can use a counter. For example, first transaction will be given a counter value of one. The second transaction will be given the higher number than this. Since all that I'm interested in is logically showing that. The, the transactions come one after the other a counter is good enough for me. Only thing is the counter eventually might become infinite, uh, infinitely large that means the counter value can become so large that at the end of it somewhere I have to reset the counter. So uh, at some point of time when there are no more you know, brief period of time like you know recess period when everybody goes off for lunch you know like that when the when there are no no transactions for a brief period you know in the system uh, you can just forget the entire earlier history you can just set the counter to zero and then start doing it again from one that point of time okay that is one way of actually giving a timestamp to the transaction this is basically a logical timestamp because all that you are doing do it saying is transaction t2 which got a counter value of 2 is higher than a transaction which got a counter value of 1. So in terms of actually looking at t1 and t2 all that that you decide in terms of the time order is the counter values okay. There are various other ways of actually giving the timestamps for the transactions. The other way is actually to use a physical clock physical clock that uh, gives the values the physical clock that gives okay this is this is like saying i will use the uh, clock time of the machine okay the clock time and then i will basically say that every clock tick i generate okay every clock tick is used okay clock tick is used is used for generating the timestamp, generating the okay. Now there are interesting this is important because every clock tick you can generate only one timestamp. So which means that the number of transactions that can come are limited now because they are limited by the number of clock ticks because the timestamp will be generated only one timestamp can be generated in a clock tick because two transactions need to get two different timestamps they cannot get the same timestamp if they get it then you will have problems of validating them at the end of the uh, at the at, at the end seeing how they will basically no, you, you need to order them. So you won't be able to order them if both of them get the same timestamp. There are interesting algorithms for generation of timestamps. In fact, there's a very very interesting algorithm which doesn't generate timestamps with respect to the starting point. It generates with respect to the time when the transaction is expected to finish. This is a extremely interesting way of looking at the problem in an entirely different perspective. This is like saying when somebody is entering into IIT it is at that point I give a tick to him or I give a band to him which means that he is expected now to follow everywhere else with that band. So the band was given with respect to when he actually came into the system. The other thing is when he is expected to leave the IIT gate I actually put a band there saying that this is the time you are expected to leave the system. If somebody shows up at the gate you know after his time is over you basically you know about that particular thing. So it is like saying that he is expected to leave the system within that particular time. I, I come to the gate at 10 o'clock now one way of saying that is I get 10 o'clock as a timestamp. 
the other way interesting way of saying is I am supposed to leave this system by 12 o'clock. So, I give 12 o'clock as a time stamp which means the ending time is given that means all the transaction if the transaction did not finish within that particular time period it will be aborted. Okay. So, it is possible for uh, no for the algorithms to generate these time stamps in extremely interesting ways. In fact, that is used for um, in, in some algorithms uh, to actually fix the band a band of time during which the transaction is expected to finish the execution. So, one can intelligently use the generation of the time to see how the transaction execution can be controlled. Now, as um, to, to just come back to the point of how the algorithm works and then see further issues with respect to this algorithm and how this algorithm is different from locking kind of an algorithm. What we do in this particular algorithm is we are actually giving a timestamp T s to the transaction. Every transaction is getting a timestamp and then the read and the write operations of the transactions read or write checked against okay, the R T x or the W T x of the okay. one of the things which I had actually forgot to mention is when you accept a read operation or the write operation immediately you need to actually update the timestamp of the data item. For example, I only showed in the earlier case how the RTA, RTS and WTS will be used to abort a transaction. For example, if those conditions are not met you are going to abort the transaction, but if you say that you are going to accept the read and the writes on the data item. For example, let us say now that this read or write on T s is accepted. Okay. If the operation is accepted, okay. if the operation is accepted, if the read or write are accepted, the abort conditions we actually saw earlier. So, I will just not mention them here. If the read or write accepted, then the RTX corresponding RTX to be updated RTS of x okay, to T s okay, highest of this is what should be made equal to you know. Okay. Now, similarly we are going to look at the write timestamp of x and then the T s okay. the highest value is set to the highest of RTX T s is set to R T s of x. Similarly, for the W T x the highest of W T s x and T s when a write operation is accepted the corresponding value is basically updated. What this means is the R T s and the W T s always reflect the uh, time stamp the highest time stamp of a transaction which either read or written on the data item x that is what actually happens by making these counters. Typically RTS and WTS are counters data counters they store the value of the transactions that have highest transaction values that either read or written on these data items. Now, let us go a little more deeper and look at how exactly the basic time stamping algorithm is different from the 2 p l kind of an algorithm. I will take a simple example and show you where exactly the difference is going to come when you apply a basic time stamping algorithm versus the locking algorithm. If you remember right we have actually taken a simple case of a transaction T 1 reading the value of x writing the value of x and then subsequently doing a read of y and then a write of y. Okay. Here basically x and y are the data items. Okay. Now, I actually read the value of x write the value of x 
then read the value of y and write the value of y. Now let us say there is another transaction T2 which exactly does the same thing as done by T1. Okay. Now what would have happened if actually I apply a two phase locking kind of an algorithm. Now T1 needs to acquire a lock on x and lock on y okay. and after that it does whatever then execute okay. then commit. Okay. After that release x and y lock on x and lock on y. Okay. This is done at the end of the execution of the commitment. Okay. So, you are going to release the lock on x and lock on y after the execution. That means, only at this point of time T2 can acquire lock on x, lock on y okay, and then execute. This is the only way T1 and T2 can proceed. So, unless T1 completely finishes, releases its lock, T2 cannot proceed. This is a very important thing that happens if I apply the locking criteria. right? But if you carefully observe, after this initial point of T1 trying to do Rx and Wx, it is at this point you can see there is no more use of x for uh, transaction T1, which means that it is possible for T2 to start executing from this point not at the later point of time. Okay. Now, there will be a read y, write y here okay. uh, and then there will be a read y, write y. Okay. This is an optimal execution of this scenario, okay. but this would not be possible if you apply the locking strategy because locking would have required two phase locking would have required you actually lock both these data items which means that it is only at this point of time the lock on x will be released. That means this will be shifted up to this point and you basically start executing the second transaction T2 from this point. Okay. So, if you mark this as T1 and T2, you can see the overlap has significantly come down because you are not able to execute now. This is the zone. I could have shifted the execution of Rx and Wx to this point, but this would not be possible if I apply actually two phase locking. And uh, let us see if it is possible for me to actually do this if I apply time stamping based algorithm. Now, what would have happened is T1 would have got a time stamp of T s 1 and T 2 would have got a time stamp of T s 2. Okay. Now, all that condition that we have is T s 1 is less than T s 2 which means that we have a case where transaction T1 has been able to get timestamp which is lower than transaction T2. Now, when they start executing at the end of at the end of execution of the first transaction T1, it will write the values of the timestamps on data item x. It is at this point of time the transaction T2 um, will try attempting accessing data item x. Since the timestamp of T s 2 is, uh, uh, is greater than T s 1 as can be seen here, uh, it is uh, it's possible for uh, T2 to access data item x at this point of time. So, what really will happen after this point is you basically will have transaction T2 accessing the data item x and then writing. Similarly, here at this point you will have the 
y being accessed by transaction uh, T 1. Now, if the T 2 can start accessing y after this point of time. Now, what can be seen here is uh, that the overlap that we were talking earlier, if you recollect what we have been talking earlier is that it is possible for the transaction T 2 to overlap with T 1 when transaction T 1 is uh, finished with uh, accessing x and now uh, tries to manipulate y. Now, this effectively is prevented in two phase locking because T 2 can access locks only after it is released by T 1 and T 1 will not release lock on x till it actually reaches this point. This is basically the lock point for for uh, the transactions. So, unless it reaches this lock point it is not going to release the lock on x and hence T 2 will not be able to start uh, executing till uh, this point of time. But whereas effectively it can start executing from this point onwards and that is what we are actually uh, looking at when we look at the time stamping algorithm. All that that matters here is the T s 1 is less than T s 2 and that is the order in which it will be allowed both x and y will be allowed to be accessed by the transaction manager. So, in other words both T 1 and T 2 will be executing in the timestamp order and this permits in some cases more concurrency than what we have seen in the two phase locking. But uh, remember this is not strictly a optimistic uh, kind of an execution because we are still looking at how the transactions should execute by looking at the transaction timestamps which were given at the beginning of the execution of the transaction not at the end right. So, it is not fully optimistic in that sense in a fully optimistic scenario this would have been done by the transactions at the end of the execution. For example, T 1 would have written all its values, T 2 would have written all its values and I will be checking which one should be sort of committing at the end of the execution. That means, both will execute to their finish and then I will actually use a validation point here and say which one of them will pass the validation and make that transaction commit. Whereas, here I am using the timestamp and using the timestamp to order these transactions in the beginning itself. I know that T, T 1 has got this timestamp T s 1 and T 2 has got this timestamp T s 2 when it uh, started executing and now if T s 1 is less than T s 2 there is order in which T 1 and T 2 will commit. If it is the other way around then the commitment is going to be uh, T 2 before T 1. Now, this uh, explains what we see as a basic time stamping algorithm, how time stamps are used for uh, concurrency control. Now, one of the things that we still did not understand here is how this uh, gets integrated, how the concurrency control gets integrated with the commit protocols. If you remember we did this exercise even for two phase locking when we tried integrating the two phase locking with uh, the commit protocol and that is the reason why we actually modified the two phase locking saying that the locks will not be released by the transaction till the transaction commits because if it releases earlier the other transactions can look at the values and this will create cascading aborts and other problems. Now, similar thing happens in the case of even time stamping algorithms we need to see how the time stamping algorithms gets integrated with the commit protocols. Now, what we will do is we will look at a simple mechanism by which the time stamping algorithms get integrated with the commit protocols. Uh, a simple exercise here will be to just look at not just the um, how the transaction writes its values to explain the problem. For example, you can uh, you, you can see here that there is a write x, there is a read x followed by write x in the case of transaction x or transaction 1. Now, 
if you uh, take that transaction has written actually the values at this point of time that is it is actually continuing to execute the other things before it actually reaches the commit point. Now, if you understand the right x here the modified value of x is written at this stage the modified value of x is written. This is strictly not correct because the transaction has not still reached the commit point here. Now, let us say at the stage of commit for some reason this has to be rolled back which means that whatever the value that has actually been written here still needs to be undone which means that anybody who is actually reading this modified any transaction coming after this would be reading the value that is written by this T1 and that potentially creates a problem in terms of how the you know transactions depend on each other. In effect we will be relaxing the concept of isolating one transactions effects on the other and uh, that is what causes this difficulty of relaxing this. What we do in this case is we will actually uh, replace this write in what we call as a pre write that means every transaction to start with will issue not a write but a pre write that means this write instruction that we are write seeing here will be a pre write and after exactly it wants to commit when it reaches this last point here this is the point it issues a write instruction that means this is a pre write on x and this is a write on x the pre writes are not exactly written onto the database not written onto the permanent storage but they are buffered pre writes are buffered and we will actually validate these pre writes and uh, make sure that the pre writes once accepted are not rejected at a later point of time from consistency point of view and uh, when a write is actually issued by the transaction updating its pre write it's never rejected it's always accepted but the pre writes uh, the transaction can still not commit a pre write which means that at the commit stage it does not issue a pre write it, it does not issue a write it is possible that the transaction pre writes will all be rolled back which means that the there is not going to be any effect of this pre writes on the actual database. What uh, we will see is now a modification taking pre writes into account how the pre writes will try to solve the problem for uh, for integrating commit protocols with uh, concurrency protocols. Now, if, if you remember we had actually uh, two checks when a, when a transaction now issues now let us say T issues a pre write. Now, this pre write has to be checked for pre write on a data item x. Now, this has to be checked for on the database items on the database timestamps. Now, this will be checked again as the read timestamp of data item x and also the write timestamp of data item x. Now, if the pre write is uh, pre write uh, timestamp of the transaction is less than either RTX or WTS x that means it is actually less than the write timestamp or the uh, read timestamp then T is aborted ok. Otherwise otherwise the pre write is buffered pre write is actually not written but what is done here is pre write x is buffered with its corresponding timestamp buffered with T s T s has its uh, timestamp ok. as its timestamp ok. Now, what does this mean? This means essentially the following all the timestamps that we are talking about here 
or with respect to this buffered item here x. For example, if x is actually a, a pre write, pre write on x is buffered with a timestamp T s. Now, any, any subsequent reads that we issue here needs to be checked again as this pre write. Now, at a later point if this pre write becomes a write on x, then it is at this point of time the actual W T s of x is updated to the corresponding T s. Okay. That means, this will stay like this for a while in the buffer when this actually comes a write comes on x, it is at this point of time it will be updated to a write timestamp of x. Now, as these pre writes are buffered as the reads come into the uh, system reads of a transaction come into the system, we still need to check uh, those reads against any of the pre writes that are already buffered in the system. Now, let us understand how the reads needs to be modified in this particular case. Now, if you typically look at read of uh, uh, x issued by a transaction t with a timestamp t s this is how we will read this. Now, this read x timestamp is t s. Now, if you remember earlier this will be checked again as the write time timestamp of x and if the write timestamp of x is uh, less than the T s we allow the read to proceed because any number of reads can be done on the data item. It does not really matter uh, as long as the read timestamp is higher than the write timestamp because uh, reads can all be done concurrently whereas, the writes have to be exclusive. Now, in that sense it does not really require to be checked again as the read timestamp. what need you need to do is you need to check only the timestamp of x in this particular case again as the write timestamp of the x. Now, if you only do write timestamp of x okay, it is less than T s I think I will put the other way around which will make things if the right timestamp of okay, x is greater than T s then basically this read has to be rejected for obvious reasons because you are actually trying to read uh, after some other transaction which came uh, after you will be is actually produce the right value. The read uh, issuing transaction is aborted. transaction is aborted. Okay. This is the same as the condition of the earlier one, but in the other case the read is allowed in the in this case the read is still not allowed when you actually have a pre writes buffered. Okay. Now, what does this pre writes buffered means? The pre writes buffered means if I have typically uh, there is a pre write uh, time stamp on x with a T s. Now, I have to check this timestamp. stamp okay. let us say it is T s p to just indicate that. Now, if this T s p is, is actually okay, less than the T s the T s is the timestamp that I am actually trying to read what does this indicate? This condition indicates that there is a pre write buffered and that uh, please remember that pre write will never going to be rejected when the actual write comes in. So, I actually need to buffer in such a case we need to buffer we need to buffer the read uh, transaction okay. read uh, uh, transaction and that means, you actually postpone read transaction and allow read only after the write has been committed allow read to happen after the write happen after the write actually comes write on x comes. This ensures that this typically will ensure that the read of the transaction happens after the write of x. Now, if, if the uh, the other condition where the read on the transaction T s is less than the T s p that is going to be the other condition then you can allow the read to happen because 
this in this particular case there, there is no uh, no pre, pre buffered rights on the on the transaction and hence this T s can be allowed to proceed read will be allowed to proceed okay will be allowed to proceed okay. Now what this shows is it is requires just a minor modification in terms of how we handle uh, when we want to integrate both commit and the uh, time stamping protocols. All that we have to additionally do is we need to actually make sure that um, the rights are handled properly in this case by ensuring that they do not actually write onto the database to start with and produce the pre writes. Uh, what we are going to do in the next lecture is we will look at uh, a host of other uh, protocols which are more optimistic than the timestamp based protocols in the next lecture. Thank you.